Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Danielle Stackis and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations at the Robert H. Smith School of Business. We are excited that you are able to join us for today's webinar on how the Internet of Things, IoT, is transforming industry, presented by Brent Lorenz, Partner of Investment Banking at Momenta. This webinar is part of the Smith Office of Alumni Relations Professional Development Webinar Series, in which we hope to provide thought-provoking and valuable content that will help alumni like you achieve your personal and professional goals. During the webinar, we encourage you to use the chat box to share any questions or comments you might have for their presenter. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the session and Brent will address them at the end of the presentation. Brent is an electrical engineer turned investment banker that focuses on the IoT market. He advises companies ranging from startups to Fortune 100 companies on matters related to mergers and acquisitions in the IoT space. Brent received his MBA from the Maryland Smith School of Business and his electrical engineering degree from Kansas State University. And now we'll get started. Brent, take it away. Great, thanks. Thanks for having me. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Internet of Things and how it's transforming industry. So we've got a, a, a short agenda here. Um, you know, in general, m many people think about IoT and identify it with the consumer market, which is an important part of the market, but we're going to be talking a little bit more about how, how IoT is being leveraged across other markets like I, um, industrial, agriculture, and enterprise. And we'll also spend a little bit of extra time talking about the evolution from smart sensors to more intelligence on the edge, such as artificial intelligence, which is really beginning to take hold and enable some powerful use cases. And so I, I think that any of us that have followed IT to, IoT to some degree have seen a lot of reports, market reports about potential market size, potentials of numbers of devices to be monitored, and the economic impact of the industry. And this really won't be one of those presentations because I think there are, there are plenty of good sources out there to show how big the market will be in predicting it and how big it is today. And instead, I'd really rather focus on talking about real impacts of IoT on industry and talk about some cool real world examples. And I think that's usually the best way for, for a, a general audience to get uh, a better understanding of where it's adding value. And then also, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what we've seen in investments, both in terms of venture capital and M&A, which is near and dear to my heart. So a quick uh, disclaimer, because I am a, a registered FINRA representative, I have to just point out that um, we're not making investment recommendations. Any of the companies that we mention here, we, rent, we bring it up for uh, a discussion on the industry rather than making specific recommendations about investments. So my background real quick is that um, I, I'll, I'll give you my background sort of to give you my perspective on the industry. And I'm looking at it from the perspective of an engineer that turned M&A advisor that's out in the trenches talking to real companies every day. And I talk to mid-sized and small companies who are out looking for potential exits. And I also talk, talk with well large known strategic buyers to understand what kinds of companies they're looking to acquire. And so I'm not an industry analyst and I don't write reports for a living, but I am focused on the industrial IoT market from an M&A standpoint. And others at my firm also perform other services like strategic advisory. We make small investments from our venture fund and perform executive recruiting. And all of this is focused on the industrial IoT market and related sectors. And on my background, as Danielle mentioned, I started off in electrical engineering from Kansas State. I focused on wireless communications and analog circuits, and I started off as a sales engineer for Texas Instruments, and I was selling what we used to call um, the embedded space, so digital signal processors, software development tools, and middleware. And that kind of evolved over time into IoT, and I was also a product manager there and spent some time at a couple of other companies doing similar work, including Wind River, which is now part of Intel. I also had my phase after I got my MBA in the year 2000, which I, I like to call my adventures in capitalism phase. And uh, I, I did three startups and I also owned a retail franchise business on the side. And all of those gave me tremendous experience about uh, buying and selling businesses and wearing different hats with startups, what to do, a lot of what not to do. And after those ran their courses, when I returned to TI, I ran a $50 million product line that was based on uh, embedded microprocessors and voice over IP software. And for the last seven years, I've been doing 
M&A advisory. And I, I promise not to give you a big commercial on Momentum Partners, but the, the kind of uh, illustrates the perspective that we come at, that we have four main practice areas that give us unique insight into what's going on in the industry. And so from an advisory standpoint, we're advising both large and small companies ranging from um, small startups to Fortune 100 companies on their IoT strategy. We also do make seed investments through our venture fund. We have an executive placement practice that places VP level uh, people and above. And again, it's all IIoT focused. And then I head up the M&A practice. So you know, let's, let's start with the big picture in that anything that can be connected will be connected, but let's talk about why and what the practical use cases are of all these devices being connected. And I like to take a step back for those that aren't as familiar with IoT and, and talk about, you know, what really is IoT and, what, you know, why do you care? And, and uh, for anybody that studied engineering, they'll recognize the control loop uh, block diagram, but it's basically IoT is a feedback loop. It's putting a sensor on a device. It's measuring something and doing something with that information. And in this example, which is an IoT, but it's a, it's a clothes dryer, and the sensor is a dryness indicator, which tells the dryer whether it's, uh, whether it's ready to dr be dry or it's done. In IoT, it's putting that sensor you know, further away in, in terms of a farm or a factory or a water pump or in a car, and it could be all sorts of information ranging from temperature, light, humidity, speed, acceleration, and you name it. And taking that evolution even further is the ability for autonomous control. And that's to make decisions on the device itself about what to do without human intervention. And we'll get into that side a little bit later. And so why now? Why is this exploding all of a sudden? And really the bottom line is that it's exploding now because cost has come down. And IoT is hitting the mainstream because the key enabling technologies are more readily available. And, and can you have imagined a few years ago an LTE modem on a watch? It's, uh, it, it's hard to believe a few years ago that that would have been possible. And, you know, Apple has now released a, a phone or, a, a, sorry, a watch with an LTE modem on it. It's reportedly not um, performing very well in the field, but nonetheless, they've, they've opened the door. So when you can put these kinds of technologies on, on sensors in the real world for, in a cost-effective manner, it opens up all sorts of possibilities. And then the next thing you have to look at about in the real world, why do you care, is you know, there's got to be some value to putting that sensor out into the market. And it's, it's actually pretty, pretty straightforward and simple in, in terms of the value of IoT. And I look at it as it's the primary reasons are you're trying to sell more stuff or you're trying to save costs. And then there's a couple other advantages. And I look at selling more things. I mean, if you look at particularly in the consumer space, adding IoT capabilities are a great way to differentiate products and sell more of them, hence the Apple Watch. Uh, it's also a way for, to, if there is a sensor in a product that's deployed in the field, it report, can report information back to the actual product designers and help them improve the products to sell more later. Um, I had a, an interesting client that was involved in putting sensors on retail end caps where they, they managed uh, uh, human traffic as they were going by to, uh, in, to uh, pick up items and what they purchased and what promotions were going well. And then that could all be reported back to the retails to, retailers to make more decisions, intelligent decisions about what promos worked and what didn't. Um, another thing we'll talk a little bit more about is predictive maintenance. So if, if you get that alert that you need the oil change, you're probably more likely to go to that source rather than randomly driving down the road when you need an oil change and going to the, the uh, local Jiffy Lube. Um, and then other things of importance is that when the factory goes down, sure, that's a, a cost problem, but um, it's, also, it's also a way to sell more stuff. If the factory is up and running, then you can sell more things. And then the other thing you see this with a lot of the service providers is that by, by managing these devices remotely, it's a great way to sell anything as a service. And you see that a lot with, for example, home security systems where it's being sold to you as a service. And on the cost side, is, uh, it, it's, it's very important in the industrial space to eliminate costly shutdowns. Saving costs is a big one. Keeping a power plant from going into shutdown and um, in reducing those costs are, are very, uh, very compelling. And, and also, the costs of compliance can be very big in the utility space. You make sure that you've uh, 
you know, dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's and reducing things like truck rolls and, uh, and losses from damage. And also look at the convenience factor of saving time. If, um, if you're saving more time by not sitting in traffic, you know, maybe that's not a direct cost savings, but it's, a, it's an opportunity cost savings and it also is a way for the vendor of that product to sell you more of it. And then finally, not to be forgotten is, um, is safety and environmental. Safety is also a big driver, and nobody ever died because they forgot their Fitbit, but people do die in automobile accidents on the job, in the street, or the battlefield, and IoT gives additional visibility that can make the world safer. So moving on to the market size, I promised that I wasn't going to go into a lot of detail on this, and I, I include this a little bit almost for, for humor in that um, the market's going to be big. There's lots of sources that show it, including credible sources like McKinsey. I've seen this chart floating around quite a bit. And, um, and so again, the market is going to be big. It's just sort of an issue of where it's going to deploy fastest and, and what industries are going to get the most value for it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And so it's, I think it's also interesting to look at the hype cycle. And those of you that read some of the Gartner reports, you, you might have seen the hype cycle from time to time. It basically talks to the curve that most new technologies go through where there's a peak of hype, and then a crash down to reality, and then the ones that survive go on to deliver benefits at a more predictable pace. And, uh, and you can find these pretty readily by doing some searching. But a couple of observations that I would like to make is that first, you know, hype around consumer devices come and go. Consumer electronics is a fast paced, fickle, high volume business and I see it every year when I go to the consumer electronics show right now the hype around the wearable fitness tractors for example it's it's really died down as the fad has subsided and the space reaches more commoditization the chip companies will continue to crank out high volumes here but I think there's less value to be add as they've reached more commodity in the industry we see a lot of momentum in industrial IOT and it's very strong we don't think it's quite peaking the need is there, but in the industrial space, the, the rollout in reality is probably still going to be a little bit slower than many have anticipated. And that's, that's sort of where the reality comes into play. And as with anything, fads come and go, but the business models that actually make money or save money will continue to thrive. And the final point I'll make on that is that we do sit, continue to see the, um, the environment for M&A to be strong as, uh, as larger buyers bolster their capabilities. So consolidation will, will probably continue. And the markets that we see that are getting a lot of um, investment and interest include things like energy, manufacturing, agriculture, and transportation. And those sectors within those that we can, <clears throat> excuse me, continue to see a lot of investment and um, buzz around include artificial intelligence and edge computing which is putting more intelligence on the end edge device and automation. So let's, let's talk about IoT 101. So IoT is, is, as I said, best known for consumer devices. And most of these are novel products that make life more convenient for us as consumers. And they leverage uh, kind of more of the monitoring capabilities of IoT in order to differentiate and sell more products. I look at automotive as an example where the automobiles become sort of a mobile IoT gateway where it's monitoring conditions like tire pressure and oil pressure and giving alerts. And I think the last time that my BMW needed service, it scheduled the appointment for itself. And obviously I had to drive it there, but that might change in the near future. And these, uh, these IoT capabilities and consumer devices, they enable product companies to differentiate themselves and sell more stuff. They, they also create a stickier subscription-based relationship with customers, which is huge, and it's, so it goes beyond the initial product sale. And they can also use that information of how we use products to figure out what else they can sell us. I, I like the, this example from Disney, and because I'd been to Disney a couple times with my own family, and I, I took note of it in that there was a, a case where Disney invested about a billion dollars on, um, on IoT. And I, I look at this as sort of consumer meets enterprise. And so the problems that Disney was trying to solve is, um, is they, yeah, they're looking to grow revenue just like anybody else. And, and there are ways to do that, is to make it easier to buy stuff, make it easier to reserve things, 
and you know, really reduce the friction in the business model and get visibility into customers' behaviors and wants. And Disney is excellent at having a positive word of mouth and having a great customer experience, but how do they make it even better? And then on the logistics side of things, they, uh, they have 80,000 cast members performing 240,000 shifts, which is, it's a huge, um, it's a huge nightmare of logistics planning. So they, they built out a sensor network, spent about a billion dollars, a thousand people, and you now buy the band for, it's about 10, 15 bucks and, uh, and everybody gets one. And the band is sort of a, it's an all in one entry ticket ID. It's your ho hotel room key. You can reserve, uh, restaurant reservations you can track your lost kid and uh, track your fast passes and if you don't know what that is that's just your your way to skip ahead in the line and uh, and it's all it's all scanned by the um, by the tags and I think the coolest way that um, that I think they implemented it is if you're if you're riding a roller coaster and you pass a sensor you don't even have to do anything and actually record some of these rides with videos and then Later on, they create videos, a personalized video for everyone that was on that ride, and they send you a link and ask, ask you if you want to subscribe to the Photo Pass and Video Pass service, and you can actually buy a, 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 a neat personalized video of you on that roller coaster, and it's really, really easy to spend money. So everything's linked back to mom and dad. Um, I subscribe to all that stuff. I bought the Fast Pass and Video Pass and spent tons of money, and so, and it was all good. Everybody was happy. And it, so it was a great way for them to increase customer satisfaction, you know, reduce costs in the logistics of planning uh, employee shifts and make, make more money. So I really like that example. Uh, Xylem and Census is another good example going to more of the industrial space. And, uh, you know, again, nobody ever died because their Fitbit wasn't working. But when the power or water go out, people notice and ask anybody that was impacted by the recent hurricane season. Last year, Xylem acquired Census for $1.7 billion, which is actually a deal that we provided strategic advisory for on the buy side, meaning that we advised the buyer on the rationale for doing the deal. We weren't the banker, but rather a strategic advisor. And this is an example of a practical problem here that, uh, that Census solves with smart water meters in their FlexNet IoT market. So if you look at the water metering market in many places in the country, meter reading is like it was 50 years ago where someone had to walk out and read the meter. Um, automated meter reading saves truck rolls, data entry, and gives real time information everywhere in the field. And it also allow the customer to instantaneously, instantaneously detect if there's water loss anywhere in the network. And if you look at the problems that census um, projects is that you know, up to 24% of water is lost. And that's a cost of $2.6 billion a year. And not only is it cost, but it's huge. It's a huge waste in drought areas like California, where they just can't afford to lose the water. And so they, they have a number of use cases that you can find on their website about where they've installed the, the smart meter network. And in some cases, they've been able to recover up to 75% of the, the water loss that was due to leaks, thefts, uh, meter reading problems. And uh, it's a mass, massive tangible cost saving plus preservation of a precious, precious national, a natural resource in some parts of the world. We'll move on a couple other examples and just a little bit more brief on a few of these in terms of um, IoT examples in industrial and agricultural. And I have to admit, as an engineer growing up in Kansas, I, I don't, I admit, I don't really find farming to be that exciting. But, and I'd rather talk about things like hackers taking control of toasters for uh, denial of service attacks and that sort of thing. But um, these are real world, real use cases. They're solving real problems. And, and the first one is Internet of Beer. There was a, a, a story about an American beer distributor called Be United that was using a GPS enabled system of sensors to, to monitor the, the quality of the beer in transit. I thought this was pretty interesting because craft beers are more sensitive to spoiling than high volume beers. So during transit, re-fermentation can occur, it increases the CO2 level and can ruin the beer. And United monitors the beers for temperature and CO2 level with a network of sensors and satellite network from Global Star, I believe. And they had a trial where the first trial led to zero waste and then Be United installed the network of sensors on all of its beer containers. 
And an, another more industrial case is uh, the internet of steam trap boilers. And so a steam trap, when, it, when the boiler fails to open, the high pressure steam leaks out. And what that means is more steam has to be produced by the boilers and it wastes energy and wastes money. A single failed steamer can, uh, can waste $30,000 per year. So most plants inspect these steam traps man manually, maybe only once a year, which it's costly and it misses many of the problems when they arise. When they break, they break, the repairs are costly and the downtime can be significant. One solution has been to connect acoustic sensors with a 10-year battery life to software monitoring on a, on a network. And there is an example that, the, uh, that, that I read about that a corn milling plant was experiencing a 15% steam trap failure rate. And after installing a network of sensors, the, uh, the savings were over $300,000. And then the final one was on, on uh, agriculture. I read an article about Verizon rolling out an end-to-end -end application called Verizon AgTech. And Verizon has been busy building out its IoT capabilities in other markets as well with its uh, $2.4 billion acquisition of Fleetmatics from a couple of years ago. And Verizon can, for example, help California winemakers comply with the California water regulations that have penalties if growers don't abide by water measurement requirements that are designed to prevent waste that we talked about with the uh, the other application. And so that's become a major issue for, um, for farming in California. So transitioning a little bit now, predictive maintenance is sort of the next step in terms of, uh, of determining something that needs to be fixed before it needs to be fixed. And uh, we have a partner by the name of Augury who is focused on the predictive maintenance market. And they have a pretty a couple of pretty good use cases and examples. So they're a startup that uses AI to power predictive maintenance solutions. And they have sensors that detect vibration and, and uh, other characteristics. And then they use an analytic engine that's tuned for specific models of machines. And these are things like heating and cooling systems. And they have a use case where they have a, a customer that's a large private university uh, 15,000 students spread across 120 buildings, big campus, 5,000 machines seen by 150 maintenance staff, and then they have a central heating and cooling plant that provides 90% of, um, of the system. And so they monitored that with their system, and Augury Solution detected and prevented unscheduled downtime on multiple cases. And they detected, for example, there was advanced bearing wear for a cooling tower, and the university was able to avoid $20,000 in cost because it was still under warranty. So by having the predictive alert that they needed to fix it, they, they saved that cost you know, for free as opposed to having to pay $20,000 to have somebody fix it. So that's sort of the basic example. Then moving forward, I'd like to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, and I'm talking about AI kind of in the context of an evolution from sensors to analytics to automation and then to AI and deep learning. So I'm looking at it as kind of an evolution from just a dumb sensor to a smart sensor to a really smart sensor. And each one is a step towards using the massive amounts of data generated by these IoT devices to go from informing humans to make better decisions to automating them and then to the device learning on its own without human intervention. And so a good example of automation is a robot in a, um, a warehouse application that opens boxes and sorts the contents, right? It's, uh, it's automation, but it's not learning on its own. It's, it's programmed very specifically to perform that task. So that's, that's more for sort of the uh, automation example. Well, and let's also another example, let's say it's an industrial processing plant. Let's say if the temperature of an equipment gets too high, it goes into shutdown, costs the company a $5 million a day and causes a safety risk. In cases like that, it doesn't make sense to send that sensor data to the cloud for decision making. The device itself, you know, often on the gateway, may, may need to make decisions on premise. And so it makes, makes a lot of sense to have some automated intelligence on the device. And the machine learning part of it is learning without explicit programming. And I, I'm gonna walk through a couple of cool examples of it. 
and then taking that a step further is deep learning. And so deep learning, what does it really mean? It's, it really means that it simulates human thinking and uh, it through different layers of processing. And it can be expensive due to processing requirements. And it also requires massive data sets to train itself on, such as millions of images, which are unstructured data. And the examples could be things like fraud detection, spam detection, image recognition. And the way to think of it is that the deep learning replaces many hard-coded rules-based, you know, programming-based systems where you start to put more intelligence at the edge. And so there's a couple of interesting examples of deep learning. And so these are more tasks rather than necessarily markets, but the characteristics to think about with deep learning is that they are training on large sets of data using layers of processing and learning to train the system. And some, so these are some good examples of things related to image processing where, uh, where they're restor restoring color to an image, uh, restoring pixelated images to, and of course it's an estimation, and identifying objects. You can imagine all the applications of identifying objects in uh, photos and videos. Uh, again, it has to go through the, uh, the training process and it has to learn what the right answers are over time. Uh, autonomous vehicles is a pretty well-known example. It's not just the automation side of if this turn right or if this do this. It's also the learning of identifying hazards of, you know, what's a, what's a stop sign, what, what's a pedestrian versus what's a curb and that sort of thing. And other classical examples are speech processing where the device learns to interpret accents and different ways of speaking and understanding what uh, what you mean and uh, other cool examples that, that I've run across are things like the Gmail smart reply where it learns what um, what a uh, proposed response is to an email and of course it takes a training process to do that financial training trading sorry and then uh, a, a, the, one of the big ones would be enhanced online search which you know goes back to the you know, find ways to help you with your wallet to buy more stuff by having more enhanced, smarter search. So those are some examples of deep learning. Now, a couple of specific examples. I, I really, I love this one because it's agriculture and um, they were just acquired for, this company was called Blue River. They were just acquired by John Deere for $300 million recently. And if you get a chance, go to the, the YouTube, you just search it up on YouTube and, and see, or their webpage and, and watch the demo. It's just a couple minutes long, it's pretty cool. Is they have a product that's called Sea and Spray, and um, you know the problem that they're solving is that farmers spend 15 billion dollars a year on three billion pounds of herb herbicides, and there's 250 species that are resistant to those herbicides. So they have a system that scans like a, an image recognition system, and it scans over the crops, and it determines whether it's a weed or it's a crop and it sprays appropriately in real time as it learns through a like facial recognition what the actual plant is. And so it, it automatically recognizes plants and, and uh, makes those decisions. So the net benefit, of course, is not only saving time for the farmer, but it's also a big benefit for the environment so that we don't have so, much, so many of the chemicals in the, um, in the system. The other one that I thought was was kind of interesting back on the automotive space, and I it, it draws my attention because they were they got a um, acquired a majority acquisition by Ford for a billion dollars from a company called Argo AI, and they're actually based in Pittsburgh, and um, they are they're helping Ford with its goal to put self-driving cars on the road by 2021. And it, they do some of the tasks that I mentioned before, which is uh, identifying objects and, and classifying road hazards and that type of thing and teaching the car to recognize what's a stop sign or a moving car or et cetera. But I, I thought it was pretty interesting because for a couple of points in that, first of all, some of the companies that you don't classically see making big um, M&A and investment bets like Ford are placing big bets. I mean, it's a billion dollars. And, uh, and the other thing I thought was interesting as I was reading some articles about, about this company is that they've talked about the competition to recruit robot engineers and machine learning experts is 
pushing salaries above two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So if you know undergraduates that are still trying to figure out which which the things to major on, maybe AI and robotics would be a good bet. A couple of things on industries to be most impacted by AI, and this this comes from a nice PwC report. And I, I think some of the applications are pretty interesting in terms of um, finance, for example, doing things like credit scoring and computerized trading. Um, automotive, we've spoken to quite a bit. The, uh, the energy space where they need to do things like price and load forecasting. And then there's other applications in other industries like targeted advertising, uh, price optimization, a number of things in travel and logistics, um, health outcome pred uh, prediction, and retail merchandising. This next one is, is a, a chart from our friends over at CB Insights. And I like this as well because and I won't go through this. This is kind of an eye chart, but it's good to show that CB Insights has created an, an AI 100 on the top startups that are using AI in different industries. And the reason why I like to show this is that um, it's to show you how broadly AI is being applied in industry. And that ranges from financial and insurance to agriculture to advertising and CRM and healthcare, and of course, automotive and robotics. And so this gives you a nice snapshot for what the startups are in the space. Then moving to pulling the thread a little bit further, we look at venture capital investments in AI. And this, this looks at primarily uh, from the side of corporate investments. And I, I just, I find it really, really interesting that we saw, for example, 30 billion in investment in 2016 from key players like Apple, Google, and IBM. And 10% uh, of that was M&A and the rest of it was actual investment. And if you look at the chart on the right, you, you look at the players that are making massive bets in AI and they are companies like Intel, Google, GE, Samsung, kind of on down the list. Uh, InQtel, which is our local uh, CIA venture fund, um, Nokia, Microsoft, Qualcomm. So they're all making big bets in AI. And a couple of data points recently, Intel just announced, I think this was last week, that they had invested already a billion dollars into AI startups. And another announcement that I saw last week was that Salesforce Ventures launched a $50 million fund for AI development on its platform. And we do end up talking with a lot of, of uh, venture capital investors, and, and it's clear that that's, those are the types of investments that they are looking for right now. And so then let's take a step further and look at exits. So this, is, uh, this takes a look at the M&A side, which is near and dear to my heart. And uh, it, I think it's very interesting in terms of, you know, first of all, the notable buyers are a lot of the same folks that have made the investments across the bottom. And, uh, and the companies that have been invested, so there are a lot of them are, are the same. So they're investing and they're buying companies. So they're investing in different ways. And if you look at the chart, is pretty interesting if you look at the growth in deal count and average deal size from 2013 through 2017, it's definitely a hockey stick. And who knows if, if it's a bubble yet or not, or if it's um, if we've reached the end of the, the uh, peak, I don't know. Uh, but it's definitely still growing quickly. And you look at in 2017, that's just year to date data. So the acquisitions are growing in number and in size really strongly. And then circling back to IoT. So IoT encompasses AI and uh, and other IoT sensors and platforms. And I also like to point out some of the examples of ecosystems that are being built through acquisition. And for those of you that aren't in the industrial space, it might come as sort of a surprise that one of the most active companies has been GE. And they've, they've built up quite an ecosystem of uh, IoT related companies and acquisitions with its, uh, its deals for companies like ServiceMax and Daintree. Uh, the, actually, the Daintree CEO has joined up with Momenta after that acquisition. 
Um, PTC up in Boston has done a, a number of, of portfolio additions. They acquired ThingWorks, which was the genesis of Amenta Partners, um, which I won't go into in too much detail today. But um, they've acquired a, a good number of other companies around machine intelligence and IoT. And then others like Cisco acquired Jasper. That was a $1.4 billion deal last year. And then the ones on the right are other companies that have been active in building IoT platforms in one way or another. And, uh, and so they kind of run the gamut from enterprise software to cloud to semiconductors and the, the industrial space. So they've all been making acquisitions in the, uh, in the IoT space to build up their own platforms and capabilities. So how, how can we help? So on Momenta Partners, I, I mentioned briefly that we, we run four different practice areas that depending on what you do and what your company might be looking for, we, we first have an advisory practice that helps develop and execute IoT strategy. And our clients range from seed stage startups to Fortune 100 companies. We also have an executive search pr uh, platform that places VP level and above people in, in roles at industrial IoT companies primarily. Uh, the M&A practice is the, the area that I head up and we primarily focus on sell side, but we also do some buy side advisory, which kind of overlaps with the advisory where we might advise a large strategic company on you know, who they should buy and why and what the targets should be. And then finally, the venture program, as we have, we've done about 30 seed stage invest, investments in industrial IoT. I, I'm not prepared to go into the details of who those companies are, but if, if you're interested in learning more about the venture fund, you know, shoot me a note and I can, I can get you introduced to the right people that, that handle that. And we also have a partner, by the way, partnership with the Cisco Chill X program, which is a uh, kind of a startup program within Cisco to spin off companies with interesting I, uh, IP. So we've been helping with that as well. So that's actually all that I have. I, th these things are, it's always kind of hard to tell whether you're talking too fast or talking too slow. So I've probably been talking too fast, but everybody can get back 20 minutes of their lunch and um, you know, feel free to shoot some questions via email. Um, and that's above on the slide. I'm also very receptive to LinkedIn invites and use it a lot for network networking. So feel free to reach out with me there. If you have questions that you want to ask, I think Danielle will uh, will sort of uh, she'll she'll uh, read those off, and um, we'll take it from there. So let me know what questions you have either now or later on in the future. Yeah, thank you so much, Brett. So we will go ahead and uh, Brent, uh, and we'll go ahead and take some of your questions. Uh, just a reminder to please be sure to type them in the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. So uh, we do have one so far, uh, just asking what is a retail end cap? Yeah, so um, so I have the dubious distinction of being one of the, the very few electrical engineering bankers that actually uh, uh, bagged groceries for five years and also owned a retail franchise for four years on, on the side for fun. So, you know, find somebody else that has that background. Um, but yeah, so a retail end is like an end, end display on a um, so we have a partner that we've worked with that uh, that I've helped with that they, the end cap is like the end cardboard display that that has products and a lot of times those end products are their end cap displays are cardboard so they may be portable they may use them for a couple of months and throw them away but they cost a fair amount of money so there's a couple of benefits of putting sensors on them and one is just to track them you know to make sure that they don't disappear and knowing where they are. The other is if you put some more sophisticated tracking technology on the end cap, you can actually start to track people by, uh, track the, uh, the movement of products. You can start tracking how long people linger looking over to the display and you start reporting those analytics back to, to a central location that the retailer can analyze and figure out, hey, is, is the Budweiser display working or not? and why and having more objective data to um, to sell more stuff and more appropriately plan. So that's that's the general idea.
another question, what would you describe as one of the most revolutionized use of cases of IoT? Well, I, so in, in my view, I think, I, th I think the most exciting revolutionary cases of, of IoT is the, the artificial intelligence and the, the automated learning because if you look at the evolution of IoT, it's kind of gone from smart, there are dumb sensors to smart sensors that help people make decisions with the data that they gather. But I look at things like uh, autonomous driving is probably going to be the one that's the most impactful where it's a combination of, um, of a lot of different facets of IoT in terms of automation, but also you're training these systems to be to be uh, to learn their their environment, right? It's a lot more complicated than you think to train a a robot. What's what's a pedestrian? What's a what's a hazard in the road? You know, and and how to make decisions. So to me, that's probably the most revolutionary. But you know, others may have other other opinions. That's what comes to mind for me. Okay. In your opinion, are there any industries that are underserved by the IoT? Yeah, great question. Industrial all the way, um, in, because it moves slow, and we deal with a lot of companies that they're all talking about it. Like oil and gas is a great one, where some of these these facilities, and and also in any kind of processing plants and chemicals and manufacturing, a lot a lot of these. Um, a lot of these industries, they're still living in the past. I mean, sometimes thing in an oil refinery, those types of industries, they, you know, they're still doing things that the way that they were doing 50 years ago. And then people, the, you know, the technicians, they retire, they take that travel knowledge with them. And uh, it, it, there's definitely a huge need for automating and changing some of these systems through the use of IOT. And it is happening, but it's it just happens slow. It's just a, it's a slow moving industry because if you think about the difference between you know a, a ten million dollar uh, oil and gas or hundred million dollar oil and gas facility as opposed to a, a watch, right? Consumer devices can change so quickly because they spit them out at high volume and things can change overnight. But um, the industrial infrastructure just takes longer for it to to take up. So. They they know they need to adapt and change, but uh, it just hasn't happened happened as quickly as um, as we all like. Okay, our next question is with Equifax and SEC cyber attacks making headlines. Do you see cybersecurity issues as a large risk to the progress Internet of Things? How much, if at all, will security issues slow the progress of the Internet of Things? Great question. Yeah, it's it's a huge issue, and you know, I made a, a joke about um, of uh, you know, smart toasters um, launching denial of service attacks, but it's been a huge issue pr primarily in the consumer space. So if you look in the consumer space, these devices get shipped with standard um, security settings and passwords that nobody ever changes, and then you've got the smart camera sitting in your house and um, and they're just they're easy to hack and, and anybody that I've talked to from that industry always tells me everything can be hacked but it's always an, an issue of how how much difficulty it it takes and so I think from the the consumer space has a has a long ways to go to to um, to beef up their their um, their ability to make these things more secure and, and, I, and you can shoot me notes offline I know know people that this is all they do for a living, uh, a couple of good companies that this is all they do is advise companies on IoT security and yeah, everything's vulnerable. So it's it's no different than than um, security records being stolen by Equifax, but there's um, you know they're they're turning these devices into um, nefarious sources of um, virus and traffic. And so I, I think it's going to continue to be a, a friction. And so you can look at it two ways, right? It's a friction in the uh, in the deployment of iot but it's also it's a business opportunity for somebody right so if you're studying cybersecurity or your firm focuses on cybersecurity and have expertise in iot there's there's i think there for foreseeable future there's going to be good business opportunity to um, to innovate and make these devices more secure Okay, we still have a few questions uh, here. So how can professionals outside of AL and IoT 
get into the space and how can they learn more? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it depends on what angle you come at it from. Cause um, so IOT is, um, I'm coming at it from kind of a different angle too, right? You know, so I'm coming at it from as a as an M&A advisor, investment banker, but with an electrical engineering background. There, if you're interested in learning more about the industry, there's a, there's a number of um, of cool classes that you can take for free on on the the major. Uh, I think somebody would have to 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 um, refresh my memory, but the, the, the main platforms that provide the uh, the free online classes and you can pay for some of the better ones and actually do online labs and, and that type of thing. I don't know if that's necessarily much of a huge resume builder, but it's definitely something for somebody that comes from outside the technology industry. I think those are good starting points to, to learn more. And um, IOT, it's like, it's like 10 years ago saying IT, right? I mean, it's it, it encompasses so many different areas. If you look at going from the the semiconductor, you know, the processor and the chip up to the network and then up further to the stack in terms of data analytics and, and intelligence, there's, there's so many different layers to it. So I think you just you kind of have to pick what your expertise should be and, and explore that area. It's, it's, it's pretty hard to, to be an expert in all of it. Okay, another one here. What do you think is the biggest challenge in IoT? Technical obstacle or people awareness? And which should be put more attention, for example, marketing or R&D? Um, I think the biggest challenge is just you know, tying, a, tying IoT deployments to real use cases that, that, um, that save, save money, save money or grow revenue in some way. I think that in order for to, um, to sort of reach that slope of like in the, um, the hype cycle and getting past the, the hype bubble and getting into real deployment, it's, it's got to focus on real use cases where, where people are making money. And I think with IOT, the value is in the data that all these devices create, right? It's not in the devices themselves. So the focus, the value of where, let's say you're a startup and you're, you know, developing a strategy, this, the, the value that your, your company is going to realize is going to be somehow leveraging that data in, in creating value as opposed to just selling the sensors themselves, because that, that's now become much more of a, of a uh, crowded space. Okay, and this will be the last question uh, we take. There's a number of other questions in here that are very specific. So if we don't address your question, uh, please feel free to email Brent directly and either he can answer it or he might be able to find someone else who can get your answers. So the last one here is how might IoT be applied in the nonprofit world where resources are typically tight? Um, I guess it, you, you got to look at what problem you're trying to solve, right? In terms of the nonprofit world, um, nonprofits generate revenue too. Um, they're just not doing it for profit. So you, you, maybe you want to email and you give me an example of, of, a, of a use case and, and um, what you're thinking. And I, and I think of, there's lots of great use cases that are quote nonprofit, but they tend to be more like smart cities and urban planning and things that are more public security and public interest and, in transparency of um, of you know security in in a city center and that type of thing that, that's kind of the, the things that come to mind and, and um, air quality monitoring and those are all that, that's maybe probably not the nonprofit that you're thinking of but that those are the things that come to mind to me that are more public interest not done for profit but somebody's got to pay for it right you know the the, the city still got a contract with somebody that's got to do the deployment and somebody that's doing doing it probably is doing it for profit um, it's just the project is fund pay, funded by taxpayer dollars. So if you have a, a more specific example for um, nonprofits that you're thinking of, um, you know, shoot me a note. We can kick it around. Uh, great. Well, for the audience, Brent, uh, do you want to mention where your company is based? Sure. We are based in the cloud, like uh, just like an IoT device. Um, no, we're we, we're based in actually in Zurich. So. We, our firm is based in Zurich, and then a number of us work in different locations throughout the U.S. and, and Western Europe. 
I, I am local here in the DC area, so I'm, I'm remote in uh, Montgomery County here. And we've got a bunch of folks in New York and Boston and Silicon Valley. And we have some, some people in Zurich, um, London, um, and uh, we're also Paris. So we've got a handful of people all over. And that actually is sort of one of our value props is that um, not everybody in IoT is in Silicon Valley and a lot could be in the industrial space. So we're able to cover things that happen at different parts of the world. Whereas um, in traditional IT and semiconductors, it, is, it seems like so much of the activities is combined to Silicon Valley, but in industrial, it's all over the place. Great. So uh, is there anything else you wanted to cover, Brent, before we wrap up? No, nope, I think that's it. I think thanks for everybody that, that's attended. And again, if you have uh, have questions or thoughts, you know, shoot me a note and or send me a LinkedIn invite, in, LinkedIn invite and we'll take it from there. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we have a webinar next Wednesday, October 4th on 10 things I wish I knew about retirement, also at noon Eastern that we uh, hope you'll join us for as well. A recording of today's webinar will be emailed and it will also be posted onto our Smith School alumni website. Uh, hope you all have a wonderful day and go Terps.